Welcome and uh, good morning and welcome to our class here at Bible Fellowship Church of Newark on the book of Revelation. Last week we studied chapter 13 or the latter part of chapter 13. Chapter 13, the context is that of a description of the beast and the false prophet. And remember we talked last time about the beast representing the future Antichrist and his anti-Christian and anti-Christ propaganda and ministry. And we also saw that he represented the, uh, was represented by the false prophet, his great uh, promoter, if you will. And what we saw in chapters 12 and 13 is really, I think, a false god, a false trinity where you have in chapter 12, we're talking about the dragon, uh, then we see the beast out of the sea, and then we see the false prophet deceiving the people to worship the beast. This then again is the counterfeit trinity. You have God the Father being counterfeited by Satan. You have Jesus Christ being counterfeited by the beast. And remember, the beast was slain and then recovered from that, so you have a false resurrection of the beast, and then you have the prophet who promotes the worship of the beast. And so there is a, a similarity, if you will, in a perverted sense of the ministries of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So today we're going to cover chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up uh, the book of Revelation to chapter 14. And so we're going to see uh, an interlude here, the seventh of these interludes, and we're going to see various visions and proclamations in chapter 14. So it's not quite as tidy as the others, could be broken up even further. So uh, let's read the first verse here in chapter uh, 14, verse 1, and this has to do with the vision of the Lamb and the 44, 144,000, the lamb and the 144,000. And so the first thing we'll see is the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion with the lamb. Let's read verse 1 together, shall we? Again, Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 14, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked and beheld the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Now, the first question we have to ask is, who are these 144,000 people? Well, if you recall, we saw 144,000 witnesses previously in the book. So the question is, are these the same? And I think... It's interesting here that these are being contrasted to those who are followers of the beast. Remember, one of the things that the false prophet required of people to be able to buy or sell was to take the mark of the beast on their forehead or on the back of their hands. And so here, these people are depicted as having the name of the lamb and the father written on their foreheads. Now, again, is this the same thing as the seal of the 144,000 we read about earlier in the book? I think it is. I think it's rather unlikely that we have two different distinct groups that number 144,000. So I believe that this is the same group that was spoken of before. And instead of a seal, it's mentioned that they have this mark of the father and the lamb on their forehead. So I see that as the same thing as the seal. Okay. So what is going on here? Well, it's said that they're standing on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion, some people want to interpret this spiritually. Some people want to see this 144,000 as representative of the church. But I think we made a strong argument before that this 144,000 represented the children of Israel, the re believing remnant of Israel that were sealed and protected throughout the tribulation period. Okay, 
So these, I think, are the same individuals mentioned in chapter 7. Some interpreters, such as uh, Dr. Walberg, sees them as surviving the tribulation here. Others say, no, they are martyrs. But I think the key here is that they are standing on Mount Zion. They're not seen as martyrs in heaven. This passage doesn't say anything about these individuals dying or suffering. You can make a good argument here that this uh, vision here is proleptic. And what we mean by proleptic is looking towards the future at the beginning of the millennium. And I think that's safe to say because it's depicting the victory of these individuals over the massive persecution of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet that is outlined for us during this terrible time of persecution in the Great Tribulation. So there are good reasons to go with that idea. And it seems to me that there are distinct echoes of a passage that we'll look at in Joel chapter 2, verses 31 through 32. Okay? I thought I had that. Okay, well, that's what happens when you're doing this too early in the morning. I'll read, uh, just mark down uh, for looking up later, Joel 2, 31 through 32. But listen to what it says and how it correlates to this picture. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivor, survivors whom the Lord calls. So notice the Joel text clearly speaks about those who escaped and were survivors standing upon Mount Zion. So the way I take this is that these 144,000 are from the 12 tribes of Israel they are sealed in their foreheads by God. They have on their foreheads the name of God, and they're preserved miraculously through this great time of tribulation, suffering, and martyrdom. And again, we have to take into to context, the context into play here. Chapter 13 is all about the persecution of God's people by the two beasts. Here, the scene depicts their ver uh, victory and the fact that they've survived and stand and sing this great heavenly music and praise to God. And you say, well, why did they survive when so many others? Well, again, remember, uh, we're going to talk about this later on when we get to chapter 20, but when Jesus Christ comes back, I believe he sets up an earthly kingdom for a thousand years populated by mortals, people who were born and then one day will die. I believe that we as believers will be there as well, but we will be there as resurrected saints, reigning and ruling with Christ. But there will also be people who enter into the millennium and in so doing will fulfill God's promises to the nation of Israel of their period of great blessing. Okay, we then see heavenly music <clears throat> talked about here in verses 2 and 3. Let's read those together. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. Again, you have this sort of amplification for intensive effect here. Uh, you know, we were playing with reverb a moment before we started the broadcast this morning. And this would be many, many more times majestic than that. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who've been purchased from the earth. Now, we're not given any details of the song, uh, just that it's exclusively learnable by this 144,000. This song is being sung before the throne, so there's sort of a confluence here of those who are on earth, and yet the heavens opening up 
for this heavenly choir to sing this new song. And the only ones that can learn it are this 144,000. Now, here we have a firm evidence of musical instruments in heaven. Music people rejoice, right? Um, it might be surprising to note that in the Old Testament there's all kinds of musical instruments, but in the New Testament they're almost entirely absent. And there's hardly any mention about musical instruments and so forth, and that is why there are some Christian groups who don't believe in musical instruments in church and in Christian worship. So that's another whole church history issue. But in, it's noticeable here that even these are stringed instruments. So it wouldn't be hard to object to the use of stringed instruments in church. So guitar players rejoice, right? We have stringed instruments being sung in heaven along with this new song that no one can learn. Okay, now we then are told something about the character of these 144,000 people who are standing upon Mount Zion. In fact, it appears that they're all men. Verse 4, these are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. Well, this, the text literally says and uses a word that we would normally translate virgins. And so we can see here that the term can be used for both men and women. Um, as to the idea of being defiled with women, it, when you read it at first, it sounds almost monastic in that in some way uh, marriage is defiling and second rate, spiritually speaking. Um, so there are two ways you can deal with this here in this passage. One, which is a common way to interpret it, is to see the whole thing it, not in reference to actual marriage and sexuality, but rather a spiritual defilement. Now, and there's a lot of truth in this viewpoint, because all throughout the scriptures, uh, sexual immorality is a metaphor for spiritual adultery and spiritual immorality. So turning away from, from the true God is depicted as adultery, particularly for the nation of Israel, because they were seen to have been wedded to God in covenant. And so any breaking of that covenant was, in effect, an uh, adulterous relationship. Even the church is called the bride of Christ. And for Christians to uh, walk away from their commitment to Jesus, in a sense, is a spiritual adultery. Seen this way, it would mean that they have not defiled themselves in pagan or idolatrous worship. And particularly in the context here, it would mean that they had nothing to do with the worship of the beast. But the second way to understand this is that they are single and chaste. When it speaks of defiled, I think you want to talk about high standards of morality, but I think that we also need to see this um, as depicting men and, and because of the specific mention of women here. They've not defiled themselves with women. So I think this really argues against the spiritual only view, although uh, metaphorically speaking, this is certainly true, that any time that anyone who's a Christian who, who walks away from the Lord is, in a sense, committing spiritual adultery and fornication and so forth. But I think what might be helpful is to take a look at what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. He was talking about whether it's good to marry or not to marry. And he says, Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that it is good in view of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is, i.e. single. So here, I mean, the great tribulation is not a time to have a family. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time. There's going to be famines, pestilence, martyrdoms, war. Past, you know, I mean, it's going to be an awful time, and it's going to be a terrible time to have a family. And so I think that's the idea here, is that these individuals have committed themselves to stay single. They've stayed away from marriage and family. They're completely devoted 
to being witnesses to the Father and the Son. Okay? And so we see that in the rest of the verse here. These have been purchased. Oh, excuse me. They, these are the ones, at the end of verse 4 here, who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have a complete commitment to Jesus Christ. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now remember, first fruits are what you would bring in offering to the Lord. It was the beginning of the harvest. You would take the, the first tenth or so of your harvest and you bring it and say, thank you to the Lord for what you're going to give. It's the precursor of the coming fullness. And so to say that these 144,000 are redeemed for the Lamb means that they're the first fruits of, of many, many, many more who are coming. And there's going to be a theme throughout this chapter that we want to grab a hold of and hang on to. And then in verse 5 it says, No lie was found in their mouth, for they are blameless. Now this doesn't say that they're sinlessly perfect. It's the sense of what the Bible calls the actions of righteous people. People who are, believe in Jesus Christ, who've committed themselves to follow him, and in consequence of that, they live a blameless life. It doesn't mean they're sinlessly perfect, but it does mean that they follow him with faithfulness and purpose. So that, I think, is an example and an explanation of who these individuals are. And again, we have to see this in context. This is a, a, a forward-looking picture of those who are going to withstand and survive the terrible attacks of the beast and the false prophet that we just read about in chapter 13. Remember, chapter divisions in the Bible are not inspired. So these verses would immediately follow the discussion about the mark of the beast and the number of the beast and all of his heinous uh, machinations against God's people. So we're now going to see three angels giving three proclamations uh, in the rest of this chapter, and we'll uh, spend the rest of our time really talking about these. Okay? So the first of these proclamations is a proclamation of the gospel of the good news to every nation. Let's read verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Now that's a little bit of an unusual gospel presentation, right? There's no mention of the cross and Jesus dying on a cross for your sins and his resurrection and so forth. So I want to unpack this a little bit and see what it says to us. I think it's significant here that the good news, even at the end of the tribulation period, the good news is still being offered to people on the earth. There's still time to repent and turn to worship the true God. Again, We've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Hopefully you'll, it'll get ingrained in your brain. Notice the gospel here is about who you worship. Okay? It's not about a conversion experience. It's about who you align your life towards in worship. Now, I happen to believe that's an act of faith. I don't believe that worship and faith are somehow divorced from one another. I believe in order to turn to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, see, and in order to worship God, you first have to believe in Him. You have to believe that He offers forgiveness of sins. You have to believe that if you repent, you will be forgiven. You have to believe that you can come to Him and He will not cast you out. But again, it's unusual here that this be preached by an angel. I mean, normally God uses his servants to present the gospel, preachers, uh, friends, neighbors. 
we all, as believers, have the responsibility to share the good news with everyone we meet and our families. So God, I think, is giving mankind a last chance to turn away from the false, false worship of the beast and to turn to the living God. So he's using this extraordinary step of proclaiming this last chance to all the people of the earth through an angel flying through heaven. Now, just how this is going to be accomplished, I don't know that we know. Um, it entails something supernatural, I think. And if you just think of the logistics, I mean, the angel would have to speak in all kinds of multiple languages and so forth. But I think it's going to be a universal sign. And it may take some time for this angel to circle the earth and proclaim this message. So um, something important that we need to realize here is that even in the midst of the most terrible time of judgment and devastation, God is offering mercy to his enemies. Notice, it's not a cheap mercy. It's not saying, hey, don't worry about what you're doing. Just come to me and all will be good. No. It's an offer of forgiveness and restoration from the, for those who would turn from their false worship, seek forgiveness of their sins, seek to obey the commandments of the one true God. That's not cheap grace. That's uh, acknowledgement of the truth of God and the wrong path that you've been on. Now, I think there's great evidence in this book of massive revival that is taking place during these last days. We see it today in the COVID crisis. We see people turning to God. My mission organization is receiving all kinds of requests for people to do videos for them, to provide training and so forth. I thought we were going to have nothing to do during this time of staying home. In point of fact, we're 10 times busier, even though we're not traveling. There's so much to do. There's so many people now who are hungry for God's word and because of what's going on. And what's going on right now ain't nothing compared to what the book of Revelation predicts and the devastation and problems. So I think that this is a very positive thing. The first part of the chapter, we see these who have been victorious, who've made it through the revelation. We even see here in the, in the tribulation, I mean, even see here in the middle of the tribulation a proclamation supernaturally encouraging people to turn to faith in Christ. And then we see a proclamation about the fall of Babylon. The next two proclamations turn negative. And another angel, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Again, remember, we're speaking proleptically here. We're kind of looking to the conclusion of this whole period of time. We're not strictly giving things in chronological order here. So it's looking ahead and sort of giving us a preview of what chapters 17 and 18 are going to give us in much more detail. Chapter 17 and 18 are all about Babylon and its destruction. And so here we're introduced to Babylon. And of course, the identity of Babylon is very much debated. And so we're going to introduce the topic here. We're going to put look at a few basic things, but we will uh, leave the rest of our more detailed discussion to when we get to chapter 17 and 18 in a couple of weeks, where that's the main topic. So there's basically three ways to understand Babylon here in the book of Revelation. And again, we'll dig into this in more depth later in a couple of weeks, but I want to just introduce the topic to you right now. First of all, Babylon often serves as a symbol of a system of false religion and apostasy. We'll see this when we get to chapter 17. This is clearly an important element in the life and activity of Babylon. There she's called the great harlot, the mother of idolatries and immoralities and so forth. So it uses very, very vivid language and uh, to describe the heinousness of Babylon's sins. Remember that it was at Babel in Genesis chapter 11 where mankind, what did they seek to do? 
You know, God told them to populate the earth. What did they do? They gathered together. They were trying to make a one-world society. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And one religion, one language. The problem is that that one language, that one religion, that one society had quickly turned to false religion. And so Babylon is always seen in the Bible as the originator of false religion. Okay, So again, there's a lot to this idea of Babylon being a symbolic for false religion and idolatry. Um, this, by the way, is part of the reconstruction of the ancient city of Babylon and what some people thought was the ancient ziggurat or tower of Babylon in the city. And what the Babylonians would often do is create temples on the top of these great towers, and they were into worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars and, and so forth. So in one sense, they were kind of like observatories as well as temples. So secondly, we see some interpreters, particularly amongst dispensationalists and some even friends of mine, who think that Babylon is actually going to be a literal city or literal resurrection of the ancient city of Babylon. And uh, I got, thought I would show you a few slides of ancient Babylon and what's going on there. The building in the back is Saddam Hussein's new palace. These are the ruins of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. But there are many places in the city where the old walls of Babylon are being reconstructed tourist site, you know, people want to go visit. There's a little walkway where you can go see the famous Ishtar Gate of the city of Babylon and so forth. So um, there are some who think, take this very literally, that somehow Babylon is going to become the center of, again, of this new world order, this new world religion. Okay. So the third option here is to see Babylon as a code name for Rome. We'll explore this idea much more fully when we get to chapter 7, and so we're going to hold off by building any argument about that because the argument most uh, makes most sense are some statements that we'll see in chapter 17. So, uh, you know, I remember an old book that... I saw in my parents' house, the title of it was Hollywood Babylon. You know. So Babylon becomes sort of a moniker for any kind of anti-God, licentious, false religion system, whether it be Hollywood or whether it be Rome or whether it be ancient Babylon. Uh, certainly, it's symbolic of all that's anti-God. And as we saw in chapter 13, remember this, we, got, we have to see all these things in context. Chapter 13, there was a concerted effort of the beast and the false prophet to promote devil worship surreptitiously through worship of the beast. And as we said then, the goal of Satan from the very beginning was to deflect the worship of God back to himself. That's been always his goal. Well, with that in mind, we then see that there's a proclamation of judgment against those who would receive the mark of the beast. Verse 9 through 11. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Well, we have here in contrast to the good news proclaimed above, the bad news. And this bad news is that anyone who receives the mark of the beast and worships the beast 
will receive the full force of God's wrath against them. Using the wine analogy for God's wrath, this is one of the most sobering statements in all of the scriptures. There's mention of torment, fire, brimstone, that's sort of reminiscent of the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And notice that the torment will be in the presence of the Lamb and of the angels. The torment is said to go on forever and ever, and that there will be no relief seen. So this is generally understood as an expression of hell. Okay. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about this. It's going to be very brief. It's not an extensive study on the doctrine of hell, but it's here and it's in our face and we need to look at it. So there are some challenges, though, to a traditional view of hell. I'll mention what that is shortly. But one that's probably most popular today in our world is that there is no hell. Death's always look upon as something, you know, you're going to a better place. You're going to your rest. So this is often said so even not dependent upon the righteousness of the person who's died. It's a message of comfort to those who've lost loved ones, but it's just simply not true according to the teaching of the Bible. There is a slight variation on this idea that it's only really bad people that go to hell. You know, your Adolf Hitlers, your murderers, your cannibals, serial rapists and serial killers. You know, those are really bad people. Yes, they will go to hell, but everybody else is generically good. And when you die, you go to a better place. Now, again, this assumes that normal people are good and that they don't deserve hell. Well, the Bible has an answer to that fantasy in Romans 3.23. We all know it, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, right? So the Bible is very clear that all humanity are sinners that deserve the condemnation of a holy God. I mean, that's the, that's the focus of the gospel, is that you and I deserve condemnation by a holy and just and righteous God because we're sinners, and yet Jesus came on the cross to die on behalf of our sin so that we could be saved. Second challenge to the traditional idea of hell is that hell is temporary. The technical name for this idea is apocatastasis. That's a hard one to say. Try to say that three times quickly. But a simpler way to talk about this view is we could simply say that hell is purgatorial. In other words, that hell is temporary in that you're working off your evil and sins through suffering and that one day it will end. This was originally advocated by the ancient church theologian Origen. It has been popularized recently in the emergent church movement guru, Rob Bell, in his book, Love Wins. Uh, to summarize this view, hell is real, but its purpose is to punish, change, and ultimately purify those who are sent there so that in the end, all people will be restored back into fellowship with God. So it's, you know, again, I, it's sort of a purgatorial idea about hell. All right? I don't think the Bible teaches that in any way, uh, although part of me says I wish it did, that there would somehow be hope for second chance for people and so forth. Um, the other view is sometimes what we call annihilationism. And it's a simple idea that in the final judgment depicted on the great white throne that we'll talk about when we get to chapter 20, is that those who are thrown into the lake of fire perish both body and soul they are actually destroyed. In other words, that at some point in time in the future, after God's judgment of every uh, human being that ever lived, that they will be punished with eternal death. And that death will mean cease, ceasing of existence. But then there's the traditional view of hell uh, that seems to be supported here. Those who are condemned in this traditional view spend eternity in everlasting torment and suffering 
with no possibility of escape. Okay. I mean, it's, it's simple as that. Here it talks about their torment going on forever and ever. And this is the same terminology uh, of eternity that is used to describe the life of God and his eternality. You might say, I don't believe in this. I cannot believe in a God who'd do this to anyone. But let me say this to you. First of all, you don't have to go there. Just as in this chapter, there's an offering of a message of good news to you. You can avoid the wrath and judgment of God by turning away from your idols of greed, lust, power, whatever it is you worship, and turning to the living and true God. Then you will never have to go to this horrible place. Again, you might say, I don't believe there is such a place. But what if the Scripture's right? Whether or not you believe it or not won't affect how true it is and that you will be there. Turn to faith in Christ today and follow Him and you can be sure that you will never go to this horrible place. Well, we move to something positive here again in this last proclamation, a blessing proclamation for those who do believe. So again, this is very black and white here. You're either going to accept the worship of the beast and you're going to end up going to hell or you're going to accept the worship of Jesus and you'll be blessed even if you die. Let's read verses 12 and 13. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Okay. You know, if you take the mark of the beast, and you follow after the gods of this world, you are going to experience torment. If you take the mark of Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you're happy, even if you're put to death. This is the the oxymoron here. They're blessed. It simply means you're happy. You'll experience blessing. How can martyrs be happy? Well, I think they're happy because they have a special standing and reward before God. I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes from all of church history. It was by the missionary martyr Jim Elliot. It says, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Okay. You cannot keep your life forever. We hang on to it. Oh boy, do we hang on to it, right? We hold on to it with tooth and nail and, and we don't want to give it up, but you can't hold on to it forever. And you can't hold on to the things of this world. You can't hold on to the money and the houses and the, and the fame and the adoration and the lusts and the pleasures of this world. You can't hold on to them. And the words of Jesus resonate here. Lay up for yourselves where? What? Treasures in heaven where no one can take them away. See? So you're not a fool, says Jim. If you give up what you cannot keep, the things of this world, to gain what you cannot lose the rewards of heaven. And so, here we're reminded of an eternal truth. That those who persevere and die in the faith in the midst of this terrible time of suffering and persecution will be blessed because they will have great standing and glory before God. It kind of reminds me, remember the early Christians, they were persecuted for preaching Christ and they came back to the, to the body of believers and they rejoiced that they were considered worthy of suffering for his name. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> you know, I'm not quite ready to, to go out and, and, hey, let's go get some persecution, you know, so we can be excited about it. But if and when it comes, I hope that the Lord would help me to be faithful. You know, all right, let's see. If we got time, let's see how far we can get. I'm ho hoping to finish the next six verses here. We'll cover them somewhat rapidly. We then see a reaping, a harvest here 
of reaping. In the first four, uh, two verses, we see the Son of Man reaping. And then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, there's a couple of issues here we have to, to deal with. Um, the first one is who is the son of man here? And I hear definite echoes of Daniel chapter 7. I won't take the time to look at Daniel 7, but remember that passage. It's very awesome. It talks about the son of man in the clouds and his returning for glory. So um, I think this is a clear reference to Jesus. So Jesus appears here and he's standing ready to reap. But the fundamental question here is to reap what? Okay. Um, and there's a couple different viewpoints here. One, some people say this is a near the end of the uh, tribulation rapture. I don't think that is what's in mind here. I'm not sure there's much support for that idea here. But most interpreters believe the context here supports the idea of a reaping of judgment. Now, that's clearly the case in the next paragraph where you have an angel doing the reaping. It's clearly a reaping of judgment. But it, could it be that the reaping here is the gathering of those who are mentioned in the immediate context before, those who've come to faith in Christ? Now, the scripture does use the metaphor of harvest or reaping in two ways. Clearly, in verses 17 through 20, it's a metaphor for divine judgment. But it's used in a positive ingathering of souls in other places. Um, for example, uh, we can take a look at John, uh, right? Before we even read this, I just want to call your attention. Remember the parable of the sower and the soils? You know, the seed is the proclamation of the gospel, the growing of fruit, and the ability to harvest that fruit is indicative of a response of faith to the preaching of the gospel. And here, Jesus uses this harvest metaphor again in John 35 through 36. He says, do not say, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving his wages and gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may be rejoice together. So I think it's possible, in fact, I'm leaning this way, that based upon the immediate context of the blessings of those who've suffered and died for their faith and remain faithful to Christ, that Jesus is reaping a great harvest of souls here that have come to faith in him right before the harvest of wrath is reaped. But I don't want to be dogmatic on it. Uh, a lot of interpreters will say, no, this is also a, a metaphor of judgment here. But in this last section of this chapter, uh, it clearly is a reaping of judgment. Okay? Oops, sorry, got into the Spanish slides there. Now you know this is the last slide for this, this afternoon. And let's read these last three verses. Another angel, verse 17, came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Well, here we have a similar but different metaphor. And here it is of a gathering together of the harvest of ripe grapes thrown into a wine press where, if you know anything about the production of wine, particularly in the ancient world, people would stamp down on those grapes in the wine press and out flowing from that would come the unfermented wine and grape juice that would eventually be turned into wine. So here the metaphor is, of these ungodly and unrepentant 
remainders of individuals in this earth, when the time is ripe, that the angel will put forth and harvest them, if you will, and throw them into this great vat of the wrath of God. And notice verse 20, very sobering here. The wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. So in this vivid imagery, the angel reaps a harvest of these grapes to be put into the wine press of God's wrath. As to the blood coming up to the horse's bridles for 200 miles, what does it mean? Well, uh, I've, I've heard this distance from 180 to 200 miles, but basically it would cover the distance of the entire region of Palestine. Um, and many think that this is a reference to the last battle of Armageddon, that in the final culmination, there'll be such massive slaughter and death and destruction that um, the valley outside of Jerusalem would be filled with blood. Um, others take it more metaphorically. Again, my tendency is to take things somewhat literally uh, until I'm shown otherwise. So in the end, we see a terrible vision of what's coming. And indeed, the next two chapters are the final judgments of God. The seven bowls of wrath poured out upon unrepentant humanity. So we're right there at the door of the culmination of God's judgment upon unredeemed humanity. Well, I just want to leave you with a word. Maybe someone's tuned in to this webcast, this streaming video, and maybe you're not sure about where you're going when you die. If you listen to Pastor Bill's sermon immediately preceding this class, he talked about coming to Christ. Come to him in faith. Turn away from the idols of this world. Turn away from the false religions and turn to Christ the true God who makes heaven and earth and all that is in it. Give him your worship. Turn to him. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins. And in so doing, the promise is that you will have eternal life, not eternal death and torment in hell. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a tremendous and frightening time that we're studying. And yet the gospel proclamation is there for all who believe will receive forgiveness. All who turn from the worship of their false gods to the worship of the living God, they will receive the blessing. And so, Father, I pray that anyone who is hearing these words would turn in faith to you. For we ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Hopefully, we'll get back to a class before too much longer. Bye-bye.